we are going to talk real briefly about kind of a, an interesting nexus that we both work in, and that's the nexus between the belief systems and multiple intelligences and perspectives Western kind of secular academic science on one hand and traditional knowledge of tribal cultures, especially here in California and the Western U.S. On the other hand, part of the tangible journey for me that took place in going down this road was actually when I started my Ph.D. program at UC Berkeley. And I was looking for a site. I was looking for a site in my tribe's territory, mostly in the South Bay, Monterey Bay region, where we could actually look at, at this nexus and, and look at how specifically my ancestors managed our watersheds and, and resources, but without having the people that lived 272 years ago in this particular watershed there to ask. And so it was the perfect medium to look at some of these questions specifically, but I needed a site. And so I started talking to state parks since obviously in the Bay Area, there's so much pavement and so many very highly modified watersheds that it was very difficult to find a site that had some semblance of a, a functioning watershed or a functioning ecosystem. So I started talking to one of my colleagues in state parks, and he took me to this small basin on the, the southwestern corner of South, San Mateo County. And he, he takes me down there one day, and we're driving up this road into the hills from the ocean side near Año Nuevo. He takes me into this valley, and it turns out this valley is actually a first contact site. We do have those in the Bay Area. This was the spot, and we could actually walk to the specific spot where on October 23rd, 1769, at about oh, 10 o'clock in the morning, the Portola expedition was walking up the coast on a nice leisurely jaunt from San Diego looking for the San Francisco Bay. And these guys were in bad shape. They were scurvy ridden. Their horses hadn't eaten very much because, as it turns out, the heathens had burned off all of the, the grass in the fall time. They stumbled upon this village who, the Kiroste people, uh, you might have heard the term Ohlone, there's actually no such thing as an Ohlone Indian. Ohlone comes from a typographical error that took place in 1864. The Kiroste people welcomed the Portola expedition. They fed them up, healed them up, fattened them up, sent, sent them off with, with guides and translators, and it was just a number of days later that they discovered the San Francisco Bay from up on Sweeney Ridge. Here we have this first contact village site that now we've relocated and is such an amazingly pivotal part of California's history that nobody knows about. And so it became this site, this medium, this place that we could actually apply some of the ideas from Western science, the geomorphology, the archaeology, the dendrochronology, all of these ologies that we can look at to illuminate in addition to talking to some of our elders, how our ancestors manage these watersheds and whether or not it might actually be possible or advisable or even economically feasible to reincorporate some of those traditional land management practices into how we manage our, our modern watersheds. We've been working on this study for a number of years now. Part of that process is then figuring out how to convey that information to the broader public. And that's where I met Dr. Petacolas and we started working on getting some of this information into museums and into educational programs. As I was going along, I started doing more and more education. My passion has always been to teach and see people learn new things. Became really involved in our education group at the Space Sciences Lab at UC Berkeley. And as part of that, when our director retired, I took over a project called Cosmic Serpent, which was designed to do what Chuck just talked about, to have science museums and tribal museum practitioners come together and talk about where is the intersection between tribal knowledge and Western science. So I took over this project. The PI of this project is a Navajo astronomer, and her co-PI is a, a Navajo elder, and a Nancy Maryboy and David Begay. So I started working with them. Their first reaction to this changeover is, who the hell are you? There's a lot of mistrust of scientists in the indigenous communities because a lot of bad things happened through the name of science. So I came to this project thinking this is a pretty simple project. In some ways, we're, we're bringing together these two cultures. We're going to have dialogue and discussion and talk about education and sustainability. And I was equipped with the evaluation data from the first workshop that they had held. And being a scientist, data is king. I came to that experience thinking I had all the data and all the experience, 
that I needed to. And it quickly became very obvious that I was very naive and had a lot to learn in this collaboration. And it took about a year for us to kind of sort through that and for me to refigure my identity and to understand that really what I was there to do is to listen and learn from these two amazing knowledge holders. And through that process, we ended up working with about 160 museum personnel and tribal community members and met Chuck through the process. And I think the biggest message from this experience that I have is I really feel that working with the tribes here in the United States and listening to what they have to say is going to be key in us sustaining human life on this planet. The way that they have managed their ecosystems for thousands of years, there's a lot of important knowledge there, and I think it's time for scientists to listen to that and to create really important partnerships and to look at these two identities and ways of thinking about life and worldviews. So I really think that we can change the world for the better, and maybe step back from that efficiency model that we're kind of getting driven towards and step back and listen.